Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce the new Codex session, and we're going to have about four speakers for this. Uh, the first speaker is Nathan Egg, from, uh, who's a video codec engineer from Mozilla, and his talk is Into the Depths, the Technical Details Behind AV1. All right, thank you. Yeah, so good morning. Uh, appreciate you guys inviting me here. Uh, today I'll be taking you into the depths, looking at the technical details behind AV1. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to start by just you know, motivating the talk. So why, why are we talking about a new video compression format? Um, well, a couple years ago, there was a study of North American internet traffic, and about 70% of all the traffic in North America was streaming media, either audio or video. Uh, a few years ago, Cisco did a projection where they said that by the year 2021, they expect that number to go up to about 82%. And what's notable about that study was that um, over the same time, they expected, or they, they anticipated that all internet traffic will go about 25%. So we're talking about a huge amount of data um, that will be, you know, essentially just streaming media. And we're expecting that because we've seen people pick up, um, we've seen people pick up 10-bit video, uh, high-definition video, HDR, um, and so forth. And so this is a, this is a pressing need. Uh, to address that, um, the Alliance for Open Media was formed with the goal of creating a video codec that's suitable for a broad set of industry use cases. So here we're talking about video on demand and streaming, you know, internet use cases, <laughs> video conferencing, uh, screen sharing, video game screen, streaming, which is different than screen, screen sharing, and broadcast. Um, the goal was also for it to be open source and royalty free, for it to have wide adoption and be broadly supported, and to be better than 30%, or to be 30% better than the current generation of video codecs. And here we were talking about VP9 and HEVC. Um, so here's a list of coding tools there in AV1. And of course, this list is too long to get into uh, with the 30 minutes I have. But guess what? We're going to try anyhow. <laughs> All right, so in, in AV1, there are three profiles, uh, main, high, and professional. And these differ um, in their bit depth and the chroma subsampling. So you'll note that they all have 10-bit support. And the reason for this is that um, we expect people who are going to be picking up AV1 to be primarily interested in 10-bit um, and, and other use cases like that. You'll see that we also have this professional uh, mode where you have 12-bit and 444 chroma subsampling, which may be of interest to, to this audience. Um, there's also uh, normatively specified a number of different levels. And so here, for a given frame size and frame rate, we have picked some normative operating points where you can have guarantees on the frame, you know, um, frame size and, in particular, the decode rate and uh, average rate, uh, number of tiles that are in the, the frame, number of tile columns that are in the frame. Um, and this is to allow you to do sizing of your video streams. Um, we added a high-level syntax to, to AV1. So VP9, if you'll recall, um, had frames. And then you would put the frames into containers. But then when we added uh, super frames that had other frames in them, that became complicated. So we created uh, this high-level syntax. We have uh, sequence headers, which start a sequence, or start, start a video stream, uh, frame headers that are the beginning of a frame, and then these notion of tile groups. And uh, the idea between, uh, behind tile groups is that uh, the tile groups can be sent independently and decoded independently. So in a real-time setting where maybe you've got some packet loss, if you lose this tile group, you can maybe just do some kind of error concealment and ignore it, and you can continue to decode your stream and, and not desync. Uh, inside the tile group, we have tiles, and these tiles are um, independently de or, or parallelizably decodable, and so that helps with um, uh, with performance. Um, so, so things that exist normatively in in uh, that high level syntax are things like color uh, and HDR. And so here, um, we've added specific points or uh, uh, code, code points for color space, color matrix, and transfer functions. Um, these are encoded directly in the bitstream. So again, with VP9, this stuff had to be added as metadata into the container. And then if you were to move your video from one container to the other, you might you know, lose that information or convert it incorrectly. And now um, you know, that problem uh, no longer exists. There's also, as part of this metadata OBU syntax, the ability to add HDR metadata. Um, and that's, that's also extendable. All right, so how do, how do co uh, you know, video codecs work? I'm sure everybody in this room knows, so I won't 
belabor this, but basically you've got this prediction stage uh, that feeds into a transform stage, that feeds into this quantization stage that goes to entropy coding, and then there's this, you know, step where you maybe do this uh, filter to kind of smooth out the artifacts introduced by, by the loss in quantization and, and, uh, and prediction. Um, and when that, you know, when that gets fed back into the uh, prediction stage, we call it in-loop filter. If, if it's not done, that's part of just the displaying. It's not, it's just called a normal filter. Um, so today I'm hoping to talk about things in all of these boxes that exist in AV1. And if we run out of time or if we get low on time, um, I'll maybe skip through a couple of them. All right, great. So we'll start with, with the easy one, right? So uh, AV1 has this multi-symbol arithmetic coder. And so uh, this is a port of the uh, entropy coder from Opus. The idea is we have a um, arithmetic coder that can handle alphabets of up to size 16. And so what we did was we took the binary trees that were in VP9 and we just simply converted them into CDFs. Um, and what that let us do is in places where we were decoding these binary symbols, we now could decode uh, multi-symbols, and if we designed our alphabet correctly and, and our, our uh, symbols properly, we can now get up to four times the throughput, right, because we could decode essentially four bits with every symbol instead of just one, so this is great for improving um, the hardware uh, implementation. We also, for hardware, use this redu reduced multiplier, so instead of having a full um, 15 by 16 multiplier, we have this eight by nine multiplier. And so what's happening is that your CDFs are 15 bits and we will just shift them down to eight and then we'll do this uh, multiply and we'll have this error that's left over. And so in, in AV1, basically we take this, this uh, error that's introduced by creating a, a smaller multiplier for hardware and we just shove that error into the first symbol and so in most cases, the first symbol is the most likely one. Um, Adaptation still occurs at 15 bits, and the reason for that is that uh, we need the precision, so if you have things that are slowly adapting, um, you know, you might, you might not catch that adaption uh, properly, you might overshoot it. And then for, uh, because we're using CDFs with these initial probabilities, we have this fast adaptation mode at the beginning, so as you code the first few symbols, um, the, 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 the probabilities will adapt quickly. All right, great, so we have, um, New transform types in AV1, so in VP9 we had two transform types, the DCT and the ADST, and the ADST is just a DCT um, type four that, that basically uh, is optimal for when you have uh, low error on, on one side of your transform and high error on the other side of your transform. Um, those were chosen independently for the horizontal and vertical directions and signaled once per prediction block. Uh, AV, AV1 has four types. Uh, the DCT and the ADST, but it also has this flip ADST, which is the same thing, but with the error on, or, or, or the, uh, the low error side on the other side. Um, and we have this identity transform. And the reason we have these uh, four types um, is sometimes, well, for, for the case of the identity, sometimes you have data that doesn't actually compress very well with the DCT, right? It's not natural, like screen content or video game content. And in some places, um, it's better just to use the identity. And for the flip ADST, um, when you're looking at motion compensated frames, you might have you know, error that's low along the border, but higher in the middle of the block. Uh, these are still chosen independently for horizontal and vertical directions, so there's a total of 16 possible combinations, and not all of them are allowed. So for example, in intra frames, where the error is really only along uh, the top and, and left edge, you'll only use the normal ADST, not the flip ADST. And again, these are still signaled uh, once per transform block. So what do our prediction, or prediction block structure look like? In VP9, there were four uh, types of splitting. Here we have 10. Um, basically, you have the same horizontal and vertical split and the, the quad split, but we've also added these um, you know, ha half splits, both on the left and right and top and bottom, plus we've added these four to one um, prediction blocks. And so, uh, We'll, we'll see later how those interact with the transform sizes. And again, um, the, the four-way split is recursive, right? So we tried actually doing recursive splitting on other of the blocks, but it turns out that that didn't give us the gain, so we just kept with one, with one place for recursion. All right, so how are the transform block sizes coded? So in, in intra, it's very similar to how it was done in VP9. Um, essentially, we signal one transform size per prediction block 
Um, for example, I got a, a picture down here, say that's a 16 by 16 block, and those are all four by four blocks. So we just signal that once, and then we know all the sizes inside of the, the intra prediction block. Um, if we have rectangular prediction blocks, like I showed on the previous slide, um, you can actually use the largest rectangular transform that fits. So if it's a one to two or two to one, uh, you can do that. If it's one to four and four to one, you can, you can do that. Um, and the, in, in AV1, the transform sizes uh, go up to 64 by 64. So we have a 64 point uh, DCT. Um, note that when you code a 64 by 64 block, you'll actually set all of the high frequencies to zero. So you'll only actually code the, the upper left 32 by 32 coefficients. Um, and the reason for that is that, you know, in places where you use a larger block and the larger transform, you kind of expect the texture to be consistent, and so you expect those high frequencies to mostly be, be small anyhow. But this was also done to um, accommodate hardware implementations where now you don't have to have these larger buffers, and you don't have to have these large lookup tables for scan orders for the coefficients on this larger block size. Um, so for inter, well, we do something completely different. So here, there is a uh, four-way qu quad tree <coughs> split, and so you'll, you know, recurse through your super block order, determining if you're going to split or not. Um, again, with rectangular prediction blocks, you can still use the largest rectangular transform that fits in that block, and the same sizes are available as intra, um, but not the same transforms. Um, okay, so for, for intra prediction modes, uh, there are more directional modes, so there are the eight directional modes from VB9 plus this, this delta coding that gives us 56 directions, so that's plus three in one direction and minus three in the other direction, that's seven times eight. Um, not all of those modes are available at smaller sizes, so I think at eight byte and below, you, you get back to this, just the eight uh, directions. We've added this smooth H and V modes, and so what happens there is that you will take, you'll smoothly interpolate between the values in the left column um, and the last value in above, like you'll carry that down and you'll smoothly interpolate across, or you can do it the other way where you'll smoothly interpolate down. That's the, the smooth HV mode. Uh, we added a path predictor. Um, there's also this palette mode where you code a color map with up to eight colors, and then you'll <coughs> use that palette and code the index of that palette. Um, and it can be different, a different palette for each of the different color planes, and it's coded using some local context model based on its neighbors. Um, <clears throat> and finally, there's this Chroma from Luma inch prediction mode, which was something that we carried over from our work in DALA. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. So the idea with Chroma from Luma is that your um, color conversion into YCBCR, you know, may, may, may decorrelate the color information kind of globally across the frame, but locally there's still some correlation. And so the idea is you want to exploit that. And so what the encoder does, um, or so what, what happens is you'll, you'll take the, in the decoder you'll take this um, already decoded Luma and you'll use that with a scale factor to create a predictor for, for chroma. So the encoder will signal this best correlation constant, alpha CB and alpha CR, um, which, which is not learned. It's literally just, you know, it's signaled. Uh, and this is good for um, screen content or scenes with fast motion. And I will, I will now um, give a little more detail about how this algorithm works. So basically, you take your reconstructed Luma pixels. Um, you'll subsample them down to the size of chroma. You'll take the average and subtract the average. Um, and so now what you have left over is sort of the AC contribution from the Luma, uh, reconstructed Luma, at least in the spatial domain. Um, you'll then use your signaled alpha, and, or you'll subtract off the, the, the average. Now that's how you're left with this AC contribution. Um, you'll use this signal, signaled scale factor alpha, um, multiply it by this AC contribution and then add it to the DC predictor, right? So the DC prediction was signaled separately and so you can kind of think of chroma from Luma as almost an enhancement to DC prediction, although we signal it uh, completely independently. Um, so, you know, interestingly, uh, this new inch prediction mode was selected a lot. So if you look at this picture here, here's the uh, original frame. And over here, it's hard to see because the light, this is this green color. And the green color was picked over there about 17% of the time. Um, and so that actually competed strongly with uh, this TM pred and smooth pred. 
modes, right? So that actually was picked more than those two combined. So uh, we were pretty pleased that, that um, we were able to integrate that into AV1. Looking at the, uh, the results for like video game streaming, it, it was fantastic, right? This is the, the test set that it did the best on. Um, CIDE 2000 is a metric that looks at the um, quality of the chroma planes and you can see that for the Twitch da data set, we got about 5% improvement there. And if you look kind of at individual um, test, uh, test sequences, you know, some of these got incredible gains, like Minecraft got great gains and, and the others. And again, that's due to just fast motion and the fact that, you know, there was no um, good chroma predictor uh, directional chroma predictor, but you can just use the Luma and use that as a, a, a good approximation for chroma. All right, um, so motion vector coding. Uh, so in VP9, there were, you could choose uh, three out of the eight total references per frame. Um, now you can pick, uh, you can use seven of them. Um, again, in, uh, like, like VP9, we have this notion of an, an alt ref. So this is a non-displayed frame. And by using non-displayed frames as references, you can create a lot of different types of structures. Um, I'm gonna skip over some of the detail on how we code the motion vectors because I don't think that's important here. But I do wanna talk about uh, compound prediction because this is kind of interesting. Um, we have this, so compound prediction is, is basically by prediction. You have two references you're predicting from. There are the one half, one half weights like we have in VP9. Um, but there's also this Inter inter compound segment mode where the pixel weights are chosen based on the difference between the two predictors. So where you have, you know, where, where the predictions differ greatly, you might favor one over the other. Uh, there's also this inter intra mode where it's just like inter inter, except for you'll have one predictor that's from an inter frame, and then you'll just code an intra frame, and you'll sort of blend these together. Um, when we do the inter intra, we only allow you to pick from a limited set of modes, so it's just the DC, uh, HV, and smooth modes. Um, but we also have this notion of a wedge codebook, which is available to both inter inter and inter intra. And here, um, what's happening is it's allowing you to blend those two predictors along this directional mode, right? So you'll take half from one side and half from the other, but it gives you this. Um, uh, partition between them. Um, and <clears throat> what's interesting about that is that you can use this for places where you might have motion in the scene and you'll have this new object that's coming in, right? And so if you use this wedge mode, you might be able to use an intra block to, you know, uh, code the object that you haven't seen before um, and then, you know, mix it with the background that you have seen before. Uh, interestingly, um, you know, the search space here is pretty large. You've got four intro modes and you've got 16 possible choices of wedges, so the space kind of gets big and, and um, more research can be done here to improve that. We add the notion of uh, a global motion model. So here you have a uh, six parameter affine model for the whole frame, and this lets us model things like translation, rotation, and scaling. And that then gives you a set of motion vectors across the whole frame and blocks either signal to use the global motion or code a motion vector like, like they always did. And so um, that, that again lets you, if you have this new object or some other object that's moving separate from the global motion, um, you're able to, to, to code that uh, separately. And also we found that the global motion model here um, accurately uh, handles the warping due to lensing, you know, the, like lens warping. Um, if you don't use global motion, but you signal use global motion, it will just default to a zero, zero vector. Um, there's also this notion of warp motion, which is sort of like global motion, except for that it takes the neighboring motion vectors around you and computes um, this, this shear where it has like a limited, limited range. Um, and this is, uh, you know, um, hel helps you capture just little deformations in a local region. And so if you think of rolling shutter, like this would help you match like a, a rolling shutter effect as you, as you pan around. Uh, and it has similar complexity as sub -pel interpolation. Right, okay, uh, so I want to talk a little bit quickly about segmentation IDs. Um, so you're, they're, this, is, this is a way to segment the image up into um, 
different uh, regions that then use common parameters. And so there are eight possible ways to, there are eight possible segment labels. And each label can have, you know, filter strengths, quantizers, uh, a reference frame or skip. Uh, this is signaled per prediction block down to eight by eight. So at eight by eight, you know, b below that, all four, four by fours will use the same, same segmentation label. Um, and you can either predict the segment ID temporally or spatially, and that's chosen per frame. So for spatial prediction, um, if you're using this to change the quantizer or the loop filter strength, um, you could imagine doing things like adaptive quantization for activity masking, or you could use it for temporal RDO and with some kind of MV tree algorithm. Um, if you were, if you chose to do temporal prediction, maybe with some video conferencing, you could use that to accurately predict all the skip flags maybe on the background. Um, so let's talk about the, the loop filters that are in AV1. Um, there's a deblocking filter, just similar to what's in VP9. We changed the order to make it better for hardware. Um, has more flexible strength signaling, so you can se signal separate horizontal and vertical strengths, and there are separate strengths for the chroma planes, um, and that can be adjusted on a per superblock basis. Um, and just note that this crosses the, the tile boundaries. We also have this constrained directional enhancement filter, CDEF, which was a combination of two experiments that were contributed to AV1. One was the deringing de filter we had in DALA, and the other was this constrained low-pass filter from Thor. Um, and basically, uh, we were able to kind of combine these two algorithms to uh, take advantage of the best of both of them. So the deringing de filter is used to do this primary filter along the direction of the edge. So you're in your, in your, both your encoder and decoder will look at, on 8x8 uh, blocks and kind of estimate the dominant direction, and then it will filter along that direction. And something like CLPF, which is this sort of uh, conditional replacement filter, will be run orthogonally across it. Um, and, and the interesting, and, and of course, like the signal strength is signal in the bitstream, just like with the previous filter. And the interesting thing here is that um, you know, running this combined CDEF actually gave us better performance than either one of the filters individually or even if we ran them in, in, in series. Um, the next, uh, or the last filter we have, loop filter, is this loop restoration. Um, so this is an enhanced and simplified loop filter from VP10. There were two filter choices per super block. You could have the separable Wiener filter that had explicitly coded coefficients. That's a linear filter. And then there's this self-guided filter, which I'm not going to get into in the interest of time. Um, this is running a separate pass after CDEF. And based on how you would signal your filter strengths, you could actually you know, pick either CDEF or loop restoration or, or both. Um, of all the loop filters, this one showed the best metrics, um, but it mostly operated as like a denoising filter and had no directionality to it. So while it, while it kind of did some of the same things as what CDEF did, it, it could do, uh, you know, ha handle different, different types of ar artifacts. Um, and for, again, to appease uh, hardware implementations, we use the output of the deblocking filter when we look outside of the super block that we're filtering. Um, and that lets us actually make choices between filters, you know, do we use CDEF or do we use loop restoration? We can actually make that choice uh, independently in the encoder um, because they don't rely on each other. All right. Um, I'm going to just very quickly talk about this because I'm running out of time. So there's this notion of, of spatial and temporal scalability. So that each, each frame can have the spatial ID and temporal ID. And when, when there's zero, it's, it's called a base layer. This could be like a low resolution frame. Um, when, when they're not zero, it's called an enhancement layer. And the idea is that um, basically your stream will just, you know, you're, you'll just reference one of these lower layer um, uh, encoded frames, right? So there's, no, there's nothing special that has to happen in the decoder. Like, this, this uh, <clears throat> scheme was designed so that you'll, there'll be this sort of special selective forwarding unit server that will look at, you know, what, what you need as a client, and it will forward you just the right frames. And then you'll, the client will, when it does the decoding, it'll just look at the, the frames that have the highest number and just decode those and display those. Um, frame super resolution, I'm not going to talk about that exactly. Um, I'll just say that it's, it's basically a technique that lets you use a smaller frame that's, that's been downsampled just horizontally and then upsampled you know, to, to reach the full, the full frame width. And the idea there is that doing this allows you to get um, 
better bitrate scaling. Uh, and I, I'll just note here that um, you still run the deblocking and CDEF filter on the smaller frame, and then after you do the upscale, you run loop restoration, which will get rid of the artifacts introduced by the upscaler. All right, and then the last one is this film grain synthesis. So this is not in loop. Um, this is the idea that you can have these grain parameters that are signaled in, in, you know, on a per frame basis. In your encoder, you might do this denoising operation. Um, and then, uh, well, you have your input, frame, your input video. You'll denoise it, but you'll take the original and you'll do this estimation of the film grain. Um, then you'll sort of signal those film grain parameters. Your decoder will decode the frame, and then it will synthesize film grain and add it back in. Um, and this was uh, something that was uh, brought to us by Netflix, and it was designed so that we could actually implement it using uh, GLSO on, on, the, on the rendering end. All right, so finally, uh, who, who is in AOM? So a lot of people are in AOM. The, people, the, the, the companies that are in blue are hardware companies, and um, as you can see, there are a lot of them. So that meant that when we were doing the design of, of AV1, they had a lot of influence in the decisions we made. I've talked about a number of those, those influences. Here's some more. We've also designed it for low latency. There's a number of video streaming and video conferencing uh, members in the alliance, and these are the things we did to keep latency low. And then the open question is, um, is it designed for broadcasters? Well, it has a decoder rate model in it. So using some of the level information I talked about at the beginning, um, you can then consider this decoder rate model, and that will tell you about buffer sizes. Um, it will limit the number of alt refs you can have in your stream, and it will guarantee some amount of decodability. Uh, the lastly, there's support for AV1 coming to hardware, because we have all these hardware providers. There's a lot of Alliance members who are planning to ship AV1 in the second half of this year, which is now. And so we expect that smart TVs will be quick to adopt it, because they'll want to be able to play Netflix, Hulu, YouTube, and so forth. Um, and so why would you want to use this in the broadcasting stack? Well, you can leverage all that investment that the industry is making in software, hardware, and, and other tooling, and maybe you could expand into the streaming market. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I, I want to see if we can get at least one or two questions squeezed in over here. So please raise your hand, and Ali will come along with the mic. Hey, good morning. Just a question on the real-time communication uh, opportunity here. Is, is there roadmap towards having AV1 be a new accepted codec for WebRTC? Or is um, that what people are thinking in, in the development of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I was just at ITF 102 uh, in Montreal recently, and there is work um, on a draft for adding it into the RTP payload and then eventually adding it to WebRTC. Uh, I would expect browser vendors like maybe Firefox and, and Chrome to pick up uh, AV1, at least for communicating with each other, and if we're lucky, we can get them to communicate across browsers until until this is maybe picked up normatively as part of that that RFC process. Okay. And the informal adoption then will that be 2018 or will it be into next year? Um, I have I, I know there are people at Mozilla right now who are looking at adding it to WebRTC, but I I I think we're also primarily focused on just getting it deployed generally for for video in the browser. I have two questions related to the film grain thing. Uh, is that a part of the encoding as well? So does it look at the video it's taking in and add those into the frame data? Or add data for the film grain into the frame data? Right, so um, <clears throat> I guess there, there are things you could do. So perhaps at some uh, content creation point, like maybe you could actually design your content where you know you're gonna be signaling those film grain parameters and not go through the step where you add the grain and then you take the grain out and do all that stuff. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then um, could it be expanded to work with arbitrary sorts of effects? I, I think we'd be interested in that. Um, this was the only thing that really came up out of the Alliance members, but if you've got other things, I'm interested in hearing about them. Right. Thank you. I think we got time for one more question. I, okay, um, does the uh, spatial uh, scalability can be implemented using tile only? I'm sorry, say it again. C 
Can you implement the scalability for the uh, subshell with different resolution with just the tool set of times? So the, the adjusted pixels are different times. Um, so what, why, you, I mean, if the, if the answer is true. Yeah, so I, th I think for spatial scalability, the idea is to, to predict from lower resolution frames. Um, are you, are you, you're asking if your tile can predict from other tiles in the same frame, or? Yeah, like the base layer, and the base layer can be the 720p, and, and, the, the, and it, a different tile can be the extension to t 1080. Um, right, so I, I think the only limitation is that you can only reference I think you, you can't reference spatial IDs, like fr frames of spatial IDs greater than your own. So it may be possible to mix them if, if that's what you're asking. I would need to check on that. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan.